Thank you, Mark. All yours. Thank you very much, Melanie. And thank you, everyone, for coming. This is really wonderful to see you, um, old friends and new. Um, and yes, it's on the theme of wilderness. Um, and uh, we're going to have some breakout rooms because it's only exists this reflection for to encourage us all, hopefully, in our journey of discipleship in this crazy time uh, in, a, in the context of a collapsing climate and war and all other horrors. It's to help us survive and uh, flourish as uh, disciples or seekers of the truth or however we like to call ourselves. So thank you for coming. Um, yes, we're in this context upon context, aren't we? The, the war has been a very painful uh, other dimension to our struggle this week, surely. Uh, and we have had the latest IPCC report with, uh, even from that conservative institution, more horrible realities uh, reminding us of our vulnerability. And it's Lent as well, so it's an appropriate theme, thinking about the wilderness as a scary place, but also a, a truthful place, a place where I think good things can happen. And we're in the realm of metaphor here, probably, but I still think it's a good one. It's the first Sunday of Lent tomorrow. Uh, so in many churches, uh, there'll be a collect for that day, talking about Jesus spending 40 days in the wilderness, tempted as we are, yet without sin. And the bit I like best from that collect and uh, praying, as you know our weakness, so may we know your power to save. So it's around that dimension of our weakness and God's power to save that I'm reflecting. Uh, that's Luke chapter four. Uh, we hear Jesus is then tempted in the wilderness. Um, he has nothing to eat. And that reminds us about our friends who have been on hunger strike and others who are planning hunger strike, Ben and Emma amongst them. Um, and the struggle with temptations in the world. Uh, Jesus came out famished. Hopefully he had a good feast at the end with his friends in the the local pub. Uh, so it's it's nothing and then it's everything, I think, feast and famine. Uh, wilderness reminds me of those themes of existential threat. Uh, now, isn't that a, a phrase that's overused now, existential threat? When I first heard it, I didn't quite know what it meant. I had to think quite hard. I was thinking initially of Jean-Paul Sartre and cafes and smoking and fancy drinks um, but it's about our very existence it's about whether we're here or not and you can't get more wilderness than not existing um, so it's not just a spiritual concept we're talking about a hard and dangerous place the sort of place where I couldn't get my medications where your friend can't get his asthma inhaler and so on um, Many of us have been involved in recruiting for the Just Stop Oil campaign, and I've been to about seven or eight of these, and there's a point where you get another scientific paper. There's one particularly about the human niche, which means where can humans live on the earth? And at the moment, there's just 1% of the surface where humans can't survive, and that will go up to a enormously large percentage where no humans could survive on the earth in, in, in a relatively short time. And listening to that the other night, I thought, I can't bear this anymore. I just want to leave this agony of too much truth, too much reality. But I didn't because others were grimly bearing it out, bearing with it too. So angst carries on. My first moment of angst was as a teenager on an interrail card, not teenager, I was probably 18 or 19. Well, I'm still a teenager then, but um, unhappy in love, um, traveling around Europe far from home. My sister was ill, kidney failure. Uh, so it was a place where I guess things began to crumble. You know, things that felt certain and confident in my life began to crumble. Uh, even in my young mind, there were themes of mortality and I couldn't sleep in that noisy Athens hotel. Um, such as the middle-class angst, but now we're talking about something a little more serious about when we feel that things are crumbling, there are no comfortable words, maybe just to repeat to ourselves. At that point in my life, when I first felt that existential angst, I 
I didn't find any God that I could cling to, although I'd been brought up a Christian, somehow God didn't feature. That made it a very bleak place. Um, a place where you could die, that's what it feels like, isn't it? It's a place where you confront nothingness. We avoid talk of death. It's not very polite in dinner party worlds to talk about death. This Ash Wednesday, I went to church expecting the priest to say, as I did when I eventually learned the world, words as a priest, remember you are dust and to dust you shall return, turn away from sin and be faithful to Christ. That's what I expected. And in a way, it's what I wanted because I, I, even, well, I need to be reminded too that I can't make myself live forever. I can't create all my own worlds. Uh, and he, he, the priest, who's a, a friend of mine, said, receive this sign of your penitence, turn away from sin and be faithful to Christ. So uh, the different words gave it a different meaning and maybe helped me dodge some mortality. Um, there's a great little book by an author called Keith, Keith Hebden uh, about spirituality for activists, which is worth reading. Its title is something like that. And Keith had this practice of imagining himself dead and gradually decomposing. Well, I know that's a bit of a gruesome thought, and I don't think it's unique to Christians to do that sort of reflection. Um, but contemplating the end, um, contemplating the desert, the wilderness as a place of risk and death has a long heritage. Um, we all can't face too much of this. We have to turn away from it. It's too much. Um, and we know it's a reality in, in our climate, chaos, looming world and war-torn and everything. Uh, temptations, not the chocolates, the, uh, the uh, reality of life when you really want to avoid pain and suffering. Ched Myers talking about the wilderness temptations describes how we have turned to oligarchy and empire away from democracy and pluralism. He talks about Jesus in the wilderness facing three temptations. The first being the temptation to economism by turning stones into bread. He calls it economism, stones into bread and turning away from an economy based on subsistence and sharing and one based on surplus extraction, accumulation and control. And that's what we've got, isn't it? A global economy which makes some mega rich. And we might choose to blame some who are mega rich of certain nationalities and let the other mega rich get away with it, but it doesn't quite make it all right. And this sort of economism world, this extraction, profit, great wealth world is criticized roundly by our prophets in Amos chapter eight, verse five, or Hosea chapter two, verse five. It's not good. So that's the first temptation, the temptation to economism. The second one would be facing political power by showing homage to the ruler of the world. Um, Jed Myers describes this as an archetypal temptation to centralized monarchy away from decentralized Republican federal sorts of structures. That makes less sense to me, but I, I get it really. It's all about power not being shared, clinging to our uh, inevitable privilege. And we find ways to do that, I guess, don't we? And the last one, which captures my imagination most maybe is the one about the temptation to idolatry. Um, and that doesn't just mean worshiping golden images of the bishop, um, which is not recommended, um, but it, it, there are various ways to be idolatrous. Um, actually mentioning my bishop, who, who I have a good conversation with, good, good, good uh, engagement with, um, we disagree about how to bring change and He's on the church commissioners, uh, which is engaged, inverted commas, with uh, big oil companies and uh, seeks change that way. And I've said to the bishop, I don't think this is happening. Uh, it's not working, is it? The change is not coming. Uh, so maybe sometimes we make a, we worship the system we have, the House of Lords or the, the way we do things rather than look at uh, deeper truths. So we certainly have idolatry of our economic system, don't we? Growth is, is our God. Um, we have idolatry too in the way we do church, I think, and, and in, in our theologies, which maybe were more theologies of an empire era, 
we hang on to things that uh, really we should let be deconstructed in the realities of this time. Um, Myers talks about the states in his books, Ched Myers, is not quoting many other authors. You can see I've not done a great learned work here. Um, the indigenous people, he reminds us, knew little of economic exploitation. Um, they had a, a way of living that was pretty sustainable and uh, less violent. And we brought the old world over, the settlers put the old world in the new world with privilege and hierarchy and turning the wilderness stones well and truly into bread. And coal pits, mountains turned into coal pits and rivers into interstate power grids, he says. So that's that horrible destruction again. And we're, we're so good at sucking out every bit of life and putting it on a balance sheet and destroying things. But Jesus had a choice, as maybe we all do, and we know which way he chose to do it. He chose life over death. Uh, Mark chapter 3, verse 2. Um, Jesus gets into trouble with the synagogue, a man with a shriveled hand. You remember that bit? Some of them want to accuse Jesus. And Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. And Jesus asks the uh, miseries in the synagogue. He says, which is lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill. But they remained silent. Um, and Deuteronomy, it's that Deuteron Deuteronomic choice, isn't it? You choose life or death. Uh, Deuteronomy 30 chapter 19 this day i call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that i have set before you life and death blessings and curses now choose life so that you and your children may live if we can choose life in the darkest of places and avoid the temptations isn't that our vocation it's a horrendously hard thing to do and there are many ways to dodge it and i guess that's often my prayer that i can by God's grace, not to dodge it, not to dodge all of it. Um, so wilderness is a good place, but a painful place. Uh, it's a place of stripping away, a place of revealing, um, all sorts of things we've constructed to make our world look so invincible start to fall away. Um, I did a law degree and, and the, uh, at the University of Kent and the... Um, lawyers were marxists and they were very into teaching us about social constructionism well i really struggled to understand that um and what it meant or what it means still is there are certain types of reality that we agree between ourselves um it's not depending on reality itself it's it's a shared way of thinking and representing the world and we develop it together so um let me give you an example um well, all our institutions, I'm going to guess, you know, the, the Church of England or the Bank of England or Primark, these are, these are all constructions. But, um, I mean, at family, what does family mean? That's something which, you know, we, we think is a, a very clear notion, but actually it's, it's a, something we've made. Not, not a bad thing. It's a very good thing, but it's not as true as some other things, if you know what I mean. Um, so some of our great creations and of imagination don't just work anymore. And I guess when faced with the climate crisis, the possibility of not having anywhere to live in this bit of the globe, then it's no use uh, knowing what the economic strategy is of certain institutions. So we realize then that we're, we have to be dependent on God and each other and all else, other things that give life and other things have to be let go of. Uh, Jesus went into the wilderness, interestingly, uh, particularly after difficult times. Uh, you can track it quite well if you look at the structure of Mark's gospel. Uh, it seems after episodes of healing, he'd often go to somebody's house. After episodes of conflict, he would go to the sea or to the wilderness. But we all understand that need to get away either for respite or for a place of encounter with a deeper truth and reflection. Or, or often the same thing happens. Both things happen in the same place. Um, so that motion, maybe it doesn't always need 40 days. There can be intense wilderness and intense community following quite close together. I used to like going around on buses, looking at things, observing the world. And um, 
I mean, some urban places are so bleak, aren't they? Um, it reminds me of William Blake's poem, London. You know that, uh, I'll play, I'll read a little bit of it. I wandered through each chartered street near where, near where the chartered Thames does flow and mark in every face I meet marks of weakness, marks of woe. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every ban, the mind-forged manacles I hear. And there are plenty of mind-forged manacles around, um, passed around by our great media often. So the bleak places where we test the truth we have and we see if our truth survives that test, is it gold or is it a, a baser metal? Um, and that truth has to look a bit like Jesus for me, um, involving some truth-telling, some mercy giving, some sacrifice making. Uh, near me, there is a Amazon warehouse being built. That's progress here in Rochdale. And what has been a perfectly decent bit of unused land, industrial land, which has absorbed a lot of water and stopped it rushing down into the town center and causing flooding, that is now being well and truly walloped upon by the builders for this Amazon warehouse. Um, and you, you can see the water being squeezed out as they lay concrete down. Um, I haven't found any angels there yet, um, and it feels a bleak place to walk around. One day we may get there with some angels to do something interesting. In this town, as in many others, there will be people gathering at Barclays Bank or other places of financial idolatry, uh, and there we will find other angels and we shall not be uh, on our own. Um, what angels have you met along the way who have encouraged you? Uh, I've met so many in my church life, um, poets and uh, interestingly people from the church, of course, people of faith and people of no faith, people with a sort of passionate love for animals or for the local community, just different dimensions. And I found lots of angels, as I'm sure you have too, in our whole uh, activist world. Um, the Insulate Britain project was lovely because we, I was in a team with so many other people with their own stories and motivations, but this deep love for people and for the earth. And, and it sort of took away my own fears about my own survival and well-being it, it was you know angels inspire us don't us don't they and and they're out there we come across them so back to mark's gospel and and i've, I've near to the end now of my reflection um for mark in mark's gospel which is always perhaps the, the best one on the wilderness and um here well not the best but it, it's an angle i'm taking today uh the wilderness there is an essential coordinate in mark's gospel it's an uninhabited desolate place it's a place of marginal existence it's a site of a community in flight as in the exodus tradition it's a place where refugees are found who wait for deliverance and we can't but think of all those people queuing up to get over borders at the moment but it's also a place uh, where you make new friends from the edges i think um it's a place where Jesus is tested, but it's a place he survives. He finds solitude. Um, but for me, the wilderness is a place where you find strength and find allies and find angels or even wild beasts who feed you. Um, it's a scary place where we're naked and the infrastructure that we build around ourselves crumbles. But beyond that agony is something truthful and hopeful because it's true um, we can't depend on our own resources we need those good angels and the kind wild beasts um, so i'm saying contradictory things but that's the nature of life isn't it it's the wilderness it might make you feel alone but there are new friends stripped bare terrifyingly of, of re our imaginations realities but we uh, discover deep truths so that's that's what I'm leaving you with, some some ramblings. 